Hello and welcome to Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Some of the most grisly cases we talk about here in the true crime community are born in American suburbia. We all know that in any house, on any street, at any given time, terrible things can be happening on the other side of the door that we can see from the street. People keep dark secrets. They tell lies. They hurt each other. Sometimes they kill each other. In just a few days, on May 9th, 2022, Hulu is releasing a five-day miniseries starring Jessica Biel entitled Candy. The series is based on a story that not a lot of people outside the state of Texas know about. In fact, I had kind of forgotten about this case until one of my longtime viewers, poor old Roy, reminded me of it a few weeks ago. I hadn't thought about this case in a while, but as soon as I started to do research, I learned it is being made into a series. Well, there's a reason for that. This story has it all. It has Christian suburban housewives, it has sex, it has jealousy, it has secrets, and it's got an ax murder. This is the story of Candy Montgomery. Let's get into it. Nineteen seventy five. Our story begins in Wiley, Texas. It's a small town just starting to grow as wealthy employees and executives from Texas Instruments were moving to the area to get out of Dallas and live in a quieter place. It was still very much the 1950s in Wiley, Texas, even in the 70s. Each morning, the men headed off to their jobs in the city, and the women stayed home to tend the children, cook the meals, and keep the houses. As is the case a lot of the time in those scenarios, the women are bored and kind of unhappy, and they fill their time with soccer practice and school activities and a little gossip. Most of the residents in Wiley, Texas were members of the Lucas Methodist Church, and their membership in that church gave them things to do, activities to plan, bake sales to prepare for, and it also served as a hotspot for local drama. One of these bored housewives was a woman named Candy Montgomery. She was a spoiled woman who was doted on as a child. She was an army brat and her family moved around a lot as she was growing up. She was fiery and independent and was known as someone who would walk over the top of you to get what she wanted. Early in her childhood, Candy moved out of her hometown. She worked, but she didn't like working. She wanted to get married and have kids and be a stay at home mom. The problem was she just couldn't find the right man. She dated and even had a few sexual partners, but she never felt like they were the right person for her to settle down with. She then met the man who would become her husband, Pat Montgomery, and well, she felt the same way about him. He wasn't very handsome, he didn't have much personality, and Candy found him boring. But Pat was going to be rich, and Candy wanted to be rich too. She decided she could overlook Pat's mediocre looks and his boring personality in exchange for the life he could provide for her. Pat proposed to Candy and she decided that he was the best shot at getting what she wanted out of life, so she accepted. The wedding wasn't anything spectacular and after the mediocre wedding, the couple had a mediocre honeymoon. Two children followed, a son and a daughter, and by the mid-1970s, Pat was earning a very good income at Texas Instruments. Candy started to feel like she might have made it. Her life was going to be what she had always hoped it would be. The family moved into the dream house and from the outside, it looked like they had it all. But Candy Montgomery was still bored. She was bored and she wasn't the only bored housewife in Lucas. Soon, she had a friend. Betty Gore was living a life similar to that of Candy Montgomery's. She was married to a man named Alan Gore. Like Pat, he wasn't very handsome and he wasn't very interesting. He was reserved and by all accounts, very, very average. Alan worked in the telecommunications field and Betty was a school teacher, but when Betty got pregnant and their daughter was born, Betty decided she was finished working. She wanted to be a stay-at-home mom and Betty got what she wanted. Alan was making enough money that they didn't need for Betty to be working, so she should be happy, right? She was not. Betty was in a slump. 
She got so depressed that people close to her insisted she see a doctor. And when she did, she was diagnosed with postpartum depression. Now, back in the 1970s, postpartum depression was viewed as some kind of mythical, mysterious diagnosis. It wasn't taken seriously, and it was most definitely not talked about openly. Betty was treated like most of the women were back then, not properly. She was given Valium and she was sent on her way. Even though Betty was struggling, she was someone that everyone in town loved. She was a friend to everyone, she was kind, and she was thoughtful, and people really loved her. Betty got pregnant again, and after the birth of her second daughter, things got much, much worse for her. She pretty much disappeared from the social scene in Lucas, and she spent most of her time in her bedroom. She was suffering. She needed help, but things like this were just not properly addressed back then. I'm not so sure they are now. Alan complained to his friends that he had no sex life and that Betty was a zombie. The doctors told him Betty would get better, but she didn't. She was unhappy and Alan was unhappy and there was just a whole lot of unhappy in little old Lucas. As the Gores struggled privately in their home, Candy Montgomery was struggling privately in hers. Candy was not satisfied and she actually sat down and made the deliberate decision to have an affair. She decided that an affair was exactly what she needed to spice up her life, to bring some excitement into her daily routine, and to make herself feel better. She wanted to feel sexy and young, and she wanted to breathe some fresh life into her boring marriage. The problem was, in order to have an affair, she needed a man. <laughs> Usually when people have an affair, it's just something that happens, right? Not with Candy. This was a decision. This was deliberate. She had made up her mind and Candy Montgomery always got what she wanted. 1979, Candy Montgomery drove to the Methodist church where she was a member to attend a weekly volleyball game. There she chatted with the other parents as the game progressed and they played with their kids. Candy knew Alan and Betty Gore. Their daughters were friends. Candy actually considered Betty a friend. But that night, maybe it was the sickly fluorescent glow of the tube lighting in the gymnasium at the church. Maybe it was the smell of sweaty sneakers squeaking on the floor. <laughs> Something was different about Alan Gore. He smiled at Candy and suddenly she realized he was the one. Candy set her sights on Alan. She began flirting with him whenever she saw him, and this intensified over the next few weeks. One night, while sitting in a car together, Candy propositioned Alan. Candy told Alan she wanted to have an affair with him. She told him it would be no strings attached, no plans for divorcing their respective spouses, no saying I love you, just sex. Alan was stunned but not stunned enough to say no. And within a couple of days, the couple began sneaking away for lunchtime meetings at cheap Dallas motels. It was everything Candy Montgomery had hoped for. She finally felt alive. Alan and Candy first started meeting every week, but then it was more than once a week. Their meetings were all Candy could think about. She would carefully prepare a special lunch and she made sure she always had something very special to wear when she met Alan. The affair went on for months. Friends began to notice that Candy had changed. She was lighter, she was smiling, she was happy. She was a little too happy. And after some prodding, Candy finally admitted to a few close friends that yes, she was having an affair. She didn't say with who, but she confirmed what her friends were thinking. As soon as people knew about this secret, the spark was gone for Candy. Alan didn't look as good as he used to. She wasn't as excited to see him as she once was, and Candy realized she was finished with Alan Gore. Well, this was fine with Alan. He and Betty had attended a couple's retreat through their church, and he had renewed his commitment to make his marriage work. Candy went to Alan and told him it was over, and they agreed to part ways, and Candy was off to look for a new man. June 1980. There was a new movie that the entire country was obsessed with, a little film called Star Wars, <laughs> and Candy Montgomery's kids were begging to see it. Candy said she would take the kids to the movie, and the kids said they wanted to bring along Alyssa Gore, Alan and Betty Gore's daughter. 
Alyssa had actually slept over at the Montgomery's the night before. The kids were close and they spent a lot of time together. All the children in the area were involved in a Bible study that week and there were a lot of activities going on. Candy decided to call her friend Betty, who was at home with a new baby, and ask her if it was okay for her to take Alyssa to the movies with her family and then once the movie was over, Alyssa could sleep over at their house for a second night. Candy called once and then again, but Betty never picked up the phone. Candy knew that Alan was out of town for work, he had flown to Minnesota that morning, and Betty was home alone. Candy figured she was busy with the new baby. She had a couple of errands to run before the movie, so she stopped by Betty's house in the morning to ask her if it was okay to take Alyssa to the movie. Candy knocked on the door to the Gore house, and Betty opened it, glowering at Candy. Something had been bothering Betty Gore for a while, and she had decided to do a little snooping around in her husband's things while he was gone. When she did so, she found cards and letters written to Alan by Candy. And when she opened the door, Betty was standing there with those cards and letters, and she was not happy. Candy was shocked, and at first she denied everything, but she knew she was caught. Candy swore up and down to Betty that the affair was over, but Betty didn't believe her. She was furious. She was yelling at Candy and calling her name. She was really upset. She told Candy she was a homewrecker and she wanted her out of their lives for good. She told her no one was going to steal her husband and she never wanted to see her again. The argument intensified and a couple of neighbors reported later on that they had heard shouting, but then suddenly it stopped. Alan Gore arrived at his destination and he began calling Betty to check in on her. Betty didn't like it when Alan was out of town. She didn't like it when he flew. It made her very nervous. There was no answer on the house phone. Alan unpacked his bags and then called Betty again in an hour and then again in 30 minutes and then again in another 30 minutes, but Betty never picked up the phone. Alan started calling friends and neighbors to find out if Betty was with them. No one had seen her. Alan even called Candy, and when he did, Candy told him that Alyssa was spending the night at her house. She also told Alan that she had seen Betty around 10 o'clock that morning, but she didn't tell him about the confrontation. She said everything seemed fine to her. Finally, Alan sent some neighbors to his house to check on Betty in the afternoon. A couple of women went over to the house and knocked. There was no answer, but they called Alan back and said everything seemed fine. Alan was not satisfied with this answer. He knew Betty would answer the phone and he knew that she expected Alan would call her when he got to his destination. So then Alan called a couple of friends of his in the neighborhood. Finally, Alan called a friend of his named Richard Parker. Richard got another man from the neighborhood named Lester Gaylor and they decided they were gonna go to the Gore house. When they got to the Gores, they knocked and Betty didn't answer, just like everyone said. So Richard tried the doorknob and he was surprised to find the door unlocked. Richard opened the door and went inside where immediately he heard a baby crying. Lester later said, when we peeked into the room, a little old baby popped its head up. It had been there all day, hadn't been fed or nothing. The men went to the baby who was limp and dehydrated. She had been crying for a very long time and she was in need of a diaper change. The men realized something was very wrong. They began carefully going through the Gore house. On the floor, they saw a trail of blood leading to the utility room. They followed the trail, and there, through a partially open door, they saw Betty Gore. She was down on the ground, and she was soaked from head to toe in blood. At first, the men weren't even sure it was Betty. Her face was so disfigured that she wasn't even recognizable. Richard turned to Lester and said, My God, she's blown her head off. They thought maybe Betty had taken her own life. But then they saw something. There in the corner of the room, leaning up against the wall, was a three-foot wood-handled ax. It was covered in blood. Betty Gore had been murdered in her own home on Friday the 13th with an ax. This is a real-life horror movie. It has all the elements. The men immediately called the police, who quickly arrived at the scene. People don't get murdered in Wiley, Texas. They sure as hell don't get murdered in their own homes in the middle of the day. There were only five police officers in Wiley, Texas. This was a little tiny town out in the country. This police department was not equipped to deal with a case like this. In fact, when an officer from Dallas, who had been called in to help, arrived at the Gore home, he was absolutely shocked 
to see the entire Wiley Police Department, along with more than a dozen neighbors, standing in the living room of the Gore House. This was not good. The crime scene was completely contaminated, and they had an axe murderer running around. It was a bad situation. Everyone around Wiley was stunned. Word very quickly spread, and over the next 24 hours, gun stores sold out of both weapons and ammunition. The residents were terrified. There was talk of a madman, a transient in the area. People claimed there had been a homeless guy that they'd had to shoo away from their businesses. It must be him. Surely this couldn't be someone from their little neck of the woods. We always blame, you know, the homeless people or the foreign people or the people who have just moved in. It's never somebody right from the neighborhood, right? Until it is. Even the police themselves wondered because the attack was so brutal. This didn't look like a dispute. This was wild. It was animalistic. And on top of the brutal death, the neighbors and police had trampled through the blood back and forth, so there was blood everywhere. There were lots of bloody footprints coming in and out of the house, through the hall, and even down the sidewalk. Now, this is unbelievable to us now. We can't imagine trampling through a crime scene. Well, okay, with the exception of Jean Benet and a couple other cases. But back in 1980, crime scenes were just not secured like they are now. And people didn't know they shouldn't be walking around a dead body. They shouldn't be in a crime scene. Alan Gore raced home from Minnesota and sat down with the police. Cops wondered if he had killed his wife before leaving on his trip that morning, but they had found a bloody footprint right near Betty's body, and it didn't come close to matching Alan's shoe size. The footprint belonged to someone very small. At first, the cops were put off by Alan's demeanor. He was calm. He was too calm. He wasn't crying. He wasn't hysterical. He was just being Alan. And as police continued to interview neighbors, they found out that's just how Alan always was. He was a man of few words and very little emotion. The police saw that the killer had attempted to clean up the crime scene, but there was far too much blood to be cleaned up. There was a bloody thumbprint on the family freezer and then again that bloody footprint from what appeared to be a rubber sandal next to the body. Then the police discovered that the killer had showered after the murder. There was blood on the bathroom wall and in the shower and sink drains. There was also a pot of burnt coffee in the kitchen on the burner that had been on all day. Betty Gore had been very brutally attacked. Police said she suffered axe blows to the face, arms, and torso. This was vicious. It was horrific. It was, like I said, something out of a horror movie. Someone was angry with Betty Gore and they wanted her dead. The police asked Alan Gore if he had been having an affair. Alan Gore told them no. As the police made their way through the neighborhood questioning all the residents, they came to Candy Montgomery's house. Candy acted shocked at the news. She made no mention of her affair with Alan, let alone the fact that she had had a major confrontation with Betty earlier in the day. In fact, after Betty's body was found, Candy actually cooked casseroles for Betty's family members who had gathered at her home. Betty's brother later said that Candy came right back into the crime scene carrying food and flowers and offering condolences. She hugged Betty's family members and told them she was just around the corner if there was anything they needed. Psycho. That takes a different kind of person, right? Not only to do something horrific, but then to act like that afterwards. That's like, it's kind of scary. Late into the day following the murder, the police received a call from Alan Gore. He had something to confess. He wanted them to know he had had an affair with Candy Montgomery. Now police were very curious. Candy had said nothing about this affair, and that sure didn't look good for Candy. The police contacted her and told her she needed to come down to the station. But before Candy did that, she retained an attorney. Now, we talk about this all the time on this channel. Hiring an attorney is what you should do before you talk to the police in a situation like this. It does not mean somebody is guilty. It also doesn't mean they're not. Don Crowder was hired to represent Candy Montgomery. He was a member of her church and he knew everybody involved. Candy insisted to the police that when she left Betty Gore's home after 10 a.m., Betty was alive. The police did not believe Candy. 
Then a woman came forward and told the police that her five-year-old daughter had gone to the Gore home around 11 a.m. because she wanted to play with Alyssa. Well, remember, Alyssa was at the Montgomery house. The little girl said that when she went up to the porch to knock on the door, she saw Mrs. Montgomery leaving Betty's house just as she was arriving. As the neighbor was talking to the police in one room, Alan was talking to the police in another room and he admitted to him that he and Betty had had a fight just before he left town because Betty was afraid that she was pregnant again and she wasn't happy about that. On top of that, she just didn't like it when Alan left town so there had been some tension that morning. Investigators went and got Candy Montgomery and brought her in for questioning on June 16th just as Betty Gore was being buried. Candy claimed that she had stopped by Betty's house to get a swimsuit and that when she left, she went straight to the church to teach a Bible class to the kids for a summer Bible camp. Candy was adamant that she had nothing to do with Betty's death and that she was not even capable of such an act, but Candy wasn't aware of the fingerprint and the footprint left in the bloody mess. June 27, 1980 Based on the evidence from the crime scene and the fact that Candy Montgomery had had an affair with Betty Gore's husband and an argument with Betty on the day of her murder, a judge granted a warrant for Candy Montgomery's arrest. She was arrested and taken into custody where she was charged with the murder of Betty Gore. Her arraignment was captured in this incredible footage that I found after doing a lot of digging around. Candace Montgomery surrendered to authorities last night with a curious, bewildering smile. She had been a suspect for more than a week, and her lawyer in the Collin County DA had struck an agreement allowing her to turn herself in. Bond was set at $100,000. This morning, her attorney, Robert Udishin, came to pick her up after securing the money with a local bonding firm. Udishin would not discuss what his courtroom strategy would be when the case comes to trial, but he maintained that Montgomery was innocent and that the state had a weak case. Uh, as far as I could tell, the only thing that the uh, police have uh, supposedly is this one fingerprint that I've read about in the, uh, the papers. And I think I've commented in the past that I would like the opportunity certainly to examine that fingerprint. Uh, I think at the most it's extremely circumstantial, assuming that they do have the fingerprint. Candace Montgomery was still highly composed as she walked from the Cullen County Jail to the courthouse. Um, Assistant yeah, District Attorney sure. Jack Pepper filed two motions with Judge Thomas Ryan asking that blood and hair samples be taken from the accused for crime scene comparison. Your Honor, we have asked that, that Mrs. Montgomery uh, be transported or transport herself to the uh, Dr. Stone, the medical examiner's office, and uh, from there have a blood sample and hair sample taken from her. Judge Ryan set a hearing for July 2nd to consider the motion for blood and hair samples. The judge then cleared the courtroom to hear one more confidential prosecution motion he was not sure was relevant to the case. Lawyers were told not to talk about it. And Candace Montgomery left the courthouse, smiling slightly, and for now, a free woman. The accused will be back in court next week. And between now and that time, the judge will decide if the prosecution's third motion will be admissible or not. No one else in Channel 5 Action News, McKinney. You know me, I love those vintage news clips. They give us such a window into that time frame, right? We get to see the people and hear their voices and look at the clothes and the way things were different back then. I just, I think it's great to be able to have that to add to these stories. At the jail, Candy Montgomery was strip searched for booking. And when the jailers removed her clothing, they found that she was covered in bruises. And she also had a large cut on one of her toes. Photographs were taken of her injuries, and a date was set for her trial, which began in October of 1980. Candy Montgomery appeared with her husband, Pat, standing by her side. He stayed with her even after he found out about the affair. Candy's attorney came out swinging, and the jury was surprised at what they heard. Her lawyer told the courtroom that, yes, Candy Montgomery had, in fact, killed Betty Gore, but she had done so in self-defense. When the time came, the courtroom fell silent as Candy Montgomery took the stand where she testified that Betty opened the door to her enraged after finding out about the affair. Candy claimed that Betty came at her with an ax, swinging at her wildly and bringing it down on her foot, cutting her toe through her shoe. Candy said the two women wrestled for control of the ax and that Candy ended up taking the ax from Betty and Betty fell to the floor. 
Candy then said she had no choice but to use the axe on Betty to save herself. Prosecutors scoffed at Candy's testimony and said that the multiple blows delivered to Betty were far and above what was needed to kill her. Candy's team hired a psychiatrist to testify that Betty had shushed Candy during the argument and that that gesture caused Candy to fly into a rage because she had childhood trauma, being shushed while being abused as a child. We all have some form of childhood trauma you can't kill somebody because they trigger it. As Candy sat on the witness stand, she cried and said over and over, I hit her, I hit her, I hit her. She said she was in a panic. She ran to the bathroom and showered, washing the blood and the gore from her body. She ran home and threw her clothes in her own washer, changed, and then appeared at the Bible class to teach as if nothing had happened. Yeah, it takes a different kind of person. The jury was sent to deliberate and everyone involved assumed it would be several days before they returned. They were all wrong. Just four hours later, the jury came back and this did not look good for Candy. The four person arose to speak and said, we find the defendant, Candy Montgomery, not guilty of the crime of murder. There was a gasp in the courtroom as Candy Montgomery was acquitted. You just wonder, don't you, how juries arrive at some of the verdicts that they do. It's, it's fascinating. Everyone in the courthouse was stunned. Candy wept as she was led from the courtroom to a waiting vehicle, and outside a large crowd had gathered and they were shouting at her, murderer. Betty's family was furious. Her brother later said that their family had not even discussed the possibility that Candy would be acquitted. Candy had cleaned up the crime scene. She had hidden evidence. She had raced home and then appeared at church acting totally normal. These are not the acts of someone who had to defend themselves. These are not the acts of a person who was forced into a confrontation and felt bad about what they had done. And certainly, someone who is defending themselves doesn't need to chop someone 40 times with an ax. Yes. There were 40 wounds. No one had considered that the jury would let Candy go, but that's exactly what they did. The whole thing is just very shocking, right? And another shocking and sad fact is that Don Crowder, one of Candy's attorneys who had helped win this trial, there was a lot of public opinion against him, ended up committing in 1999. Candy and Pat Montgomery moved away to Georgia, but they later divorced. Alan Gore remarried, and then he lost custody of his children to his in-laws. Candy Montgomery is alive and well. She now goes by Candace Wheeler. She lives in Georgia, and she works with her daughter Jenny as a mental health therapist with teens and adults suffering from depression. How do you feel about this case? I'm curious. Maybe I'm being too hard on Candy. I've been known to be a bit jaded. <laughs> A lot jaded and you know maybe I'm being too tough on her I just know that if I ever had to defend myself I wouldn't be trying to cover up what I had done I wouldn't shower in the dead person's bathroom or run home and clean myself up and then head to church acting like nothing had happened those things I know but I want to know what you think and I want to know if you are planning to watch the miniseries coming to Hulu. I'm really looking forward to it because Betty Gore is being played by Melanie Linsky from Castle Rock and XX and Yellow Jackets, which, oh my gosh, if you're not watching Yellow Jackets, you got to watch it. It's so good. I love Melanie Linsky and I'm very much looking forward to seeing her portray Betty Gore. It won't be the first time these events have been made into a movie. This case inspired the CBS television movie, A Killing in a Small Town, which aired on May 22, 1990, and starred Barbara Hershey as Candy Montgomery, although the character she portrays was called Candy Morrison in that version. I've also heard talk that Elizabeth Olsen is going to play Candy Montgomery in an HBO production. So this story is really hot right now, which of course means I had to bring it to you guys. I always try to bring you guys a mix of older stories, well-known stories, and new stories, or stories you haven't heard so much, and I hope you like it. This is an age-old tale, one that we've heard time and again, but one that never ceases to fascinate us. Stories like this remind us that things are never quite as they appear and that dark secrets and fantasies are locked away in the house next door. 
We just never hear about them until they're on the front page of the morning paper. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, True Crime Tuesday. Hit the like button if you like the video and please subscribe to my channel if you would like to support me. It really does help. Stay safe and be kind to each other and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.